I'm, I'm the singer in a uh, sort of modern punk rock band. Um, so if you see me looking sort of fidgety or un uncomfortable up here, it's because I'm resisting the urge to stage dive right now. That's what I'm used to. <laughs> so I'll try and repress those urges. Um, yeah, it's an honor to be here. Uh, the Zeitgeist Movement has been a big influence uh, on my life personally. It's been very formative for the ideas that my band speak about in the lyrics and topics that we address. Um, so yeah, let me just introduce myself a bit more for those that don't know me. There we go. Uh, yeah, Enna Shikari is my band. We've been together for 10 years. Uh, we've been lucky enough somehow to be touring the world for the last seven years. Um, we make music that disregards, nice cheesy photo there, uh, disregards uh, music genres like traditional boundaries. Um, we try and make music that's an amalgamation uh, of all sorts of influences that we pick up along the way. <clears throat> yeah, and hopefully we, we just attempt to make optimistic, passionate music a sort of soundtrack to this ceaseless tussle for progress that we're all in. The other thing that I do with my life is own a clothing company called Step Up Clothing. Uh, we attempt to use one's torso as a billboard um, for like po positive social messages rather than just a corporate logo. Um, and we sort of tick all the, uh, the right boxes. It's organic, fair trade, carbon neutral. Obviously, it's really sad that that is like a unique selling point and not the norm throughout uh, clothes manufacturing, or all, all manufacturing, really. But um, yeah, so that, that's, that's me. Um, today, I'll be talking about defending music's social value. Is there a, uh, there's a jug of water here. I don't know whether I should just slug from that, because I don't have a, uh, <laughs> don't have a glass, but um... <laughs> I'm used to it, it's fine. Um, so yeah, I'm going to split up the uh, talk into two parts. First of all, sort of talking about uh, how powerful music is, uh, and then how the current system that we're in uh, limits music's power. There you go. Thanks, man. So there's one thing that separates our species from all the other species on this planet, one sort of obvious thing, the power of intricate language. Uh, both verbal and written language enable us uh, to have this sort of ever-expanding collective human mind. We're able to learn throughout our lifetime and then pass on that knowledge, that knowledge from generation to generation. Obviously, all other animals, what they learn dies with them. Um, so there's two sort of tools or two spheres that we use to do this. I think they can be well, broadly defined as science and art. They, they're tools that we use to widen our knowledge uh, and our perspective. Uh, science and art, one speaks in acronyms and hypotheses, the other speaks in poetry and melody. But they're both here to sort of explore a common concern, to establish a viewpoint. Uh, I mean, they're just exploration, they're both experimentation. Uh, I know, I mean, myself and many other artists would describe their work as experimentation. Um, yeah, they're both there, science and art, to increase our outlook, our perspective in the world, to explore ourselves and our position in the universe. So, music is the most powerful of the arts. I'll be talking about, as I said, how powerful it is, how awesome it is. Uh, and I mean awesome in its traditional sense of the word, not in this sort of modern devalued, uh, you know, where you could say like, oh, Jenny, your hair is awesome. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure it's lovely, the, the hair, but yeah, it's not awe-inspiring on, on, you know, say the magnitude of the universe. Uh, music is truly awesome. Uh, and then I'll be talking about how, like many things today, it's being limited by our current economic system. Right. I'm sure we all love music. Everyone here probably listens to it all the time. We can sort of define it most simply as organized sound. We use a variety of tools and techniques to create a variety of textures, timbres, melodies, rhythms. And with those, we can generate a variety of emotions with almost immediate effect. Uh, it can manipulate our mood, it can increase our pain threshold, um, and it can aid our mental health. It has a very broad functionality. So I'm going to speak about its, uh, its personal value and its social value. 
Plato said, music is a more potent instrument than any other for education because rhythm and harmony find their way into the inward places of the soul. Now he's been somewhat corroborated by modern science. The neuroscientist Oliver Sacks says, more of the brain is involved in perception and response to music than to language, mathematics, or anything else. So that's why music seems to consume us. That's why it gets to the very fiber of our being because it engages nearly every area of the brain that we know of. Music even accesses the primitive but vital areas of the brain, usually used only for biologically uh, imperative uh, behaviors. So I'm talking about eating, reproducing. These areas are accessed by the brain chemical dopamine, which I'm sure you've all heard a lot about. It's that hormone that's associated with pleasure and reward. Uh, many drugs also, for instance, target dopamine. Uh, now, the bewildering thing here is that music is an abstract art form. It's not tangible. You can't eat it, you can't drink it, you can't mate with it. You can mate to it, but you can't mate with it. <laughs> you can't snort it either. So that is to say, music is not biologically relevant, yet it still access, accesses these biologically relevant areas of the brain. That's why it seems to nourish us. That's why we give it enormous intrinsic value. It can make us cry with joy or weep with desperation. Walter Pater, the English essayist, said, all art aspires to the condition of music. It's, it's sheer immediate power. Music can inspire and enthuse. It can make us persevere through the most harrowing hardships. One example, obvious example, the genre of blues. It helped the slaves. It was a crucial tool uh, for slaves as a, as a catharsis, slaves in America. Um, it, it helped lift spirits. It was a stress relief. It strengthened their community. It got them through the ordeal, which was everyday life. So in that way, it is a stress relief. Uh, it is, it's proven to reduce cortisol, the stress hormone that suppresses our immune system, amongst other things. Um, and intense music listening, so in solitude, uh, it can create brain states very similar to meditation, uh, and the, the mainstream is now sort of becoming privy to how important meditation is. Uh, it's also very therapeutic. Uh, this is Henry. Uh, if you haven't seen the uh, sort of YouTube videos about him, I strongly recommend you check it out. It's incredible. Um, so music has this therapeutic value. Uh, it can be beneficial or even restorative for things like Alzheimer's, autism, strokes, Parkinson's, and many other cortical problems. Uh, this has been, again, vastly uh, documented by Oliver Sacks and Isabel Peretz, amongst others. So Henry has an advanced state of uh, Alzheimer's where he's pretty much now mute. Uh, he only communicates in sort of grunts. Um, but if you pop a pair of headphones on him and play some of the music from uh, throughout his life, from his childhood, it will literally bring him back to life. He'll become animated, he'll start singing along, like jigging along, um, and he becomes very lucid as well. So momentarily uh, afterwards, after you take the headphones off, he's, lit he's literally transformed. Um, you can enter into conversation, he can talk about his life, he'll talk about the music. Um, it's uh, truly amazing, you, you should check out the, the videos. Um, so music evokes emotion. An emotion can awaken memory. So music brings back the feeling of, of life when nothing else can. I'm just going to sneak in a bit of water. Uh, right. That's its personal value. I'll now move on to its social value. At the moment, we revel and rely on division in this society. The old divide and conquer axiom still reigns free. Artificial segregation is prevalent throughout society. Class, creed, race, they're all exaggerated, and they obviously keep us from approaching the real issues facing society. Climate change, nuclear weapons, our diminishing resources, all of this. Now, music is an important device to fight this kind of pervasive nature of, of a divided society because it is inherently communal. Inherently communal, what do I mean? by that. One example would be if we were just to all open our mouths and sing, don't worry, I won't ask you to, um, we'd be immediately releasing the brain chemical oxytocin. 
Now, this has been dubbed the love hormone or the bonding hormone. It's released when you hug someone. It's released during orgasm. It's released during all sorts of social and maternal behaviors. So literally, just singing with one other person or a group of people creates a very tangible chemical bond with them, with immediate effect. Uh, now, obviously, some people may be thinking, well, look, mate, I can't sing. If I opened my mouth and started singing now, I would be creating no bonds with anybody. <laughs> um, <laughs> but don't worry, many studies have proved that it doesn't matter. Um, you can almost hear the weariness in uh, the conclusion to one scientific study, which said the following. Group singing can produce satisfying and therapeutic sensations, even when the sound produced by the vocal instrument is of mediocre quality. <laughs> so, music is incredibly useful for quiet reflection in solitude, but it is also one of the best tools to bring people together. Music has been fundamental and central to every human culture we know of. I'll say that again, every human culture, every tribe, every civilization that we, we know of that has walked this earth has had music. So music is special for its antiquity and ubiquity. Um, and it's always been used as a tool to increase social relations. So these instruments here are uh, ranging from 20,000 to 30,000 years old. The oldest instrument that we've so far discovered is 50,000 years old. That's it's sort of the, the date that we think it was from. So we're talking way back into the Paleolithic times here. It has been with us since day one. No offense is meant to bongo or banjo players, by the way. <laughs> So I'm gonna digress briefly and just talk about a personal experience uh, that we sort of got caught up in, uh, our band. So a member of a band that we had toured with throughout America, um, that we sort of thought we knew, uh, turned out we obviously didn't. Uh, one member of that band began sort of using his, his, pedital, his pedestal that he'd been given through playing music to start communicating these sort of vile views. There's no such thing as a gay Christian, the same as there's no such thing as a Christian who loves his sin. Don't be deceived, homosexuality is a sin. It's what Jesus died for, blah, blah, blah. Uh, these are obviously vile, antiquated, it's nonsensical drivel. Um, but it's more than that. What it really struck me as is, as a musician, what a contradiction, what a total misunderstanding of your job. Music has been a tool to unite us for tens of thousands of years. Now, thankfully, there was a bit of an uproar. Uh, myself, I was writing blogs all about it. Others got involved too, lots of written pressure, and he actually quit music. <laughs> One small victory. So now he's free. You know, we, we still live in a society, thank God, with freedom of speech. He can go on a street corner, get a little soapbox, sell pens from a cup, spouting views like this. <laughs> but he sure as hell ain't using music as a tool for bigotry. <laughs> the musical instrument is an instrument of unity. So, regardless of music's inherent communal nature, it can be used to communicate positive or negative social values. Therefore, it is a powerful tool. So on the positive side, you just have to find the, where are we? Come on, there we go. Uh, you just have to find the right combination of rhythms, melodies, lyrics, and you are gonna build a group identity. You're gonna amass people to take action. It's the perfect partner or even catalyst for social change. Now it's not surprising I'm here today that my band's music is often defined as socially conscious. Um, and from our touring experience, uh, I can tell you that this is needed throughout the world. Uh, there's a severe lack of it. This is one of my band's mission statements, really, uh, is to try and redress that awful imbalance there is of kind of between soulless music and soulful music. Um, people often sort of thank us whilst we're on tour for because uh, they feel em em um, emboldened 
uh, by the sort of, you know, a, a band of, of, sort of some kind of prominence communicating the views that they value, and it, it enthuses them, um, and, and anyone with a, with a will to save the world. So another label we're given is that we're a political band. And this, you know, we hate labels for one, because you know, we come at things with a punk mindset, like you can't label us, man, you don't know us. <laughs> <coughs> but political band makes us extremely uncomfortable. And I'll tell you why. It's because that seems to describe us as though we're an anomaly. It fails to realize that all music encourages or endorses something. August Wilson, the American playwright, said, all art is political in the sense that it serves someone's politics. Now, even the most vain, brainless pop music that ignores the real world or anything relevant is still political. Uh, it's political in its decision to disregard communicating anything of worth or pertinence whatsoever. So, if we're labelled, and many others like us are labelled as a socially conscious band, then by default, my, my plea, my, my demand to the music media, by default, when mainstream rap artists make sexist, egotistical music, with lyrics that glorify greed and glamorise violence, or when pop stars make grandiose, narcissistic, repetitive, soulless music, can we not label that for what it is? Socially unconscious music. Perhaps that wording will make us realise that it is these types of music that should be the anomaly. Now, at the moment, we do live in tough times, and you can tell this because of popular music's best, or at least perceived best, social commentator is this. Oh, hold on, I'm just loving that guy's face right now. <laughs> He's so in awe of her buttocks. Um, yeah. Popular music's best, or at least... <laughs> <laughs> I'm tempted to do it again, shall I zoom in again? <sighs> Sorry. Childish. <laughs> um, music's perceived best social commentator is this asshole. <laughs> he... <laughs> he... <laughs> He recently had the audacity to state that free market capitalism will get Africa out of poverty. Um, obviously, maybe he, he put to the back of the mind, uh, his mind uh, the commercials that he did for BlackBerry. Uh, BlackBerry, like all mobile phone companies, uh, systematically rape Africa of its minerals for their mobile phone circuitry. Of course, there's no fair trade implementation. It's complete exploitation. This is not getting Africa out of poverty. The hypocrisy here is cringe-inducing to the point of facial cramp. <laughs> right, the other side of the coin. Music's worst social commentator. Obviously, there's an abundance. Um, I think one of my personal favorites uh, is Britney Spears. Um, <clears throat> just as Bush was beginning his bloody wars in the Middle East, she condoned mass murder by saying this. I think we should just trust our president in every decision he makes. <laughs> Great advice, Brittany. <clears throat> what happened to all the Bob Dylans, the John Lennons, the Bob Marleys? Uh, <laughs> luckily... <laughs> luckily, it, it, people like that, with views like that, are everywhere. Underground hip-hop, hardcore punk, folk, many other genres contain some great social commentary. You just won't find them on daytime radio. So, in conclusion of part one, music imprints itself on the brain deeper than any other human experience. Therefore, it is a powerful tool that can communicate to updating or stagnating social values. Now, unfortunately, within our system, I think it may aid the latter. Music's benefits can be tainted, and its 
power can be limited, it can be distorted for profit. So that's what I'm talking about next. Our system limits access and absorption to music. I've never met an artist who willingly and wittingly wants to limit their audience. But within a market-based economic model, we do exactly that. We limit our audience by their purchasing power. What we effectively say is, if you don't have enough disposable income, you are not permitted to live a life enriched by art. Now, just like the slaves that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, the people who are too poor to afford good access to good music, maybe those are the ones who need it the most. Now, obviously, there's a catch-22 here. If you want to dedicate your life to the creative act, you're forced to sell your music to buy yourself time to continue in the creative act. But since I began recording my favorite songs off the radio onto tape, the golden days, um, we've seen technology skyrocket. We've seen technology disrupt the very fundamentals of the music industry. Thanks to technology, anyone now can produce good quality music. We're entering an era where recorded music is now at zero marginal cost. With file sharing, it's very low profit. So recorded music itself is outgrowing the ideological confines of our current economic system. Music is shouting on the rooftops of our current institu institutions. Technology has enabled me, music, to be free. And technology is enabling so much more free access to so much more. Perhaps it is time that society caught up with modern te technological progress. Perhaps it's time society restructured and realigned itself with these new possibilities. Now, next. Our system also limits participation to music. For most of human history, if you can talk, you can sing. If you can walk, you can dance. Music was this all-inclusive communal activity. It's only in the last 500 years that we've seen this sort of distinction arise. It's cut society in two. We have the music performers and the music listeners. Now, most of us don't have the time or money for this, this indulgence, this almost perceived extravagance that is music. Music is very much treated as extracurricular. Many schools now are not teaching music in America at all. Uh, to play or learn a musical instrument is fairly expensive. Funding for art is always the first to go in educational austerity measures. God forbid we invest in teaching our kids to be creative. The industry is crumbling. So like many others, the profits are falling. There's less funding. There's less chance to work within music. Today, we do a good job of preventing people from being musical. Now, the idea that music is just some luxury that you'll get around to if you, if you have the time and you can afford it, is regressive to any future we can dream of. But luckily, music itself is expanding. Technological advancement has spread the power of creation wider than ever. We now sit down in front of a laptop, we have an orchestra at our fingertips. Try explaining that concept to Mozart. Thirdly, music limits intrinsic motivation. We heard all about this from, from Melissa in her awesome talk. Um, intrinsic motivation, just to recap, it's the joy of the task. The, the reward is the task itself. It exists within an individual. Uh, extrinsic motivation comes from outside an individual. It's the rewards, the punishment. In business, it's the cash incentives, the carrot and stick. Um, as soon as we introduce monetary gain, an extrinsic incentive, to an enjoyable act, we lose sight of the intrinsic benefits, the intrinsic benefits that I spoke about at the beginning of the talk, and it can diminish our natural drive. It can dampen natural enthusiasm and stifle creativity. Mark Twain said, work consists of whatever the body is obliged to do, play consists of whatever the body is not obliged to do. Of course, with art, with music, nothing worthwhile can be accomplished without an enthusiasm, a zest, a desire to create. If that enthusiasm, that zest, that desire is instead for monetary gain, the art will be corrupted and untruthful. In the case of music, profit will begin to dictate sound. 
Lastly, in this way, our system also limits expression and innovation. Within a market-based economic model, music is a commercial commodity, just like anything else. It's to be bought and sold. Intrinsic benefits are ignored, ignored and music is reduced to a product. It's all very cringe. Now, one big negative of this is if you alter your expected product too much as a musician, as an artist, people may lose interest. You may lose your customers. So in this way too, profit begins to dictate sound. You become a slave to your audience's expectations. You can't stray too far from the path, you're the already beaten path, should I say. So you're not autonomous in your creativity. Now, one example, I can, again, I can speak personally. We, as I've said, we, we, we come at our music with a punk mindset. We're breaking genre boundaries all the time. Um, but if, if we, for, for instance, broke all the expectations, the genre boundaries, if our, our, our next single that we brought out was, say, a 12-minute instrumental piece for the lute, I'd probably be looking for a new job within a week. So that finds us in a limited artistic environment where compartmentalization and stasis reign. Now this deters artistic expression and innovation. You get stuck in a loop making the same type of thing. And if you're doing the same thing day in, day out, boredom will always set in. Music is this vast spectrum. We shouldn't settle down in one little section of it. Uh, we shouldn't limit ourselves. Too often I hear things like, I'm a metalhead, so I'm only going to listen to metal. Everything else, make that shit. Uh, I also hear, you know, I'm a raver. I, I dance music. That's all, that's all I do, man. That's all I do. <laughs> I, I often like to use the dessert analogy here. I love chocolate cake, right? Who doesn't? But sometimes I want lemon meringue or uh, profiteroles, for instance. <laughs> Uh, as the industry declines, safer music is funded. Uh, mainstream music is completely distorted for profit. We get served this barrage uh, of high fructose junk food music uh, that is, of course, funded and promoted by corporate interests. David Hume said, the corruption of the best things gives rise to the worst. Underground, innovative, imaginative music becomes peripheral and nugatory. And, of course, in this situation where expression is limited, any possibility of music criticizing the status quo goes out the window, at least in the mainstream. Corporate power is easily able to silence any view that doesn't sit comfortably with the status quo. One example, the BBC already censoring any lyrical content with reference to a free Palestine. So, <laughs> As the system encourages repetitive music, it reinforces repetitive music, homogenized music, we begin to enter a dangerous stage. Surrounded by this dulled down type of music, you become very comfortable to the point that you're actually not even required to be attentive to the auditory input. Music becomes background noise requiring no effort or no thought on the part of the listener. Now, this is why we grow out of nursery rhymes. They're too basic, they're too obvious. The predictability of the music makes it lose all its power. Upwards of eight, things like these stop exciting us. I'm speaking from personal opinion, I don't know if that gets anyone moving and going. <laughs> if our expectations aren't jolted, if the music is dull and repetitive and homogenized, we literally stop using our mind. And as all of you in here, I'm sure will know, if you stop using your mind, others will gladly step in. So, the future. Uh, for anyone, I, I think this is gonna be put online, I don't know, if, if it is, then uh, anyone watching this online who perhaps has come, of it, come at it from uh, uh, my uh, tweeting of it, people that don't know what the Zeitgeist Movement is, I strongly suggest that you check it out, that the core ideas at least uh, see the vast possibilities um, that are out there in terms of a sustainable future. Uh, it talks about, the Zygus Movement talks about how we to work to implement a worldview rooted in science for the benefit of all the world's people. 
Now, one of the most vital things that we need to achieve is the value shift. And art can help create a true culture that's based in sustainability and equality, that's based in the real world, not a bullshit culture. Now, this will obviously be, obviously be tough because people, most people are too busy shopping or watching what not to wear or listening to Britney Spears. <laughs> But music can be an integral part of creating an informed, thoughtful, and engaged youth. It can be an antidote for the apathy, the disconnect that sets in as we grow up and become institutionalized. So we need to support honest music. It's one way of helping create an intelligent and progressive culture. Um, as a quick caveat, of course, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying all music needs to be overtly socially conscious to be beneficial. Art can open the mind just by being innovative, just by being beautiful. Uh, one example, uh, of course, is Sigur Ross. Uh, I'm sure you all heard of, of them. Now, you can't extract any meaning from their music because the singer is singing in his own made-up language. So, it doesn't matter because you still walk away feeling enlightened. You feel, you feel stimulated by the music. It opens your mind. Music also doesn't have to be overtly socially conscious to be beneficial because it does one thing that we pretty much don't see anywhere else in society. It allows unifying communal experiences. Gigs, shows, festivals, these are some of the only reasons left for us to literally just come together and celebrate life. So, to conclude, in the future I'd like to see music more available for the audience. And like anything else really, hopefully this is the direction society is headed in with open source and free access. But if we can use the full employment of current technologies, like lots of other things, music can become free for all. Our economic structure needs to catch up with this. Music should not be just a privilege for those that can afford to pay for it. John Lennon said, music is everybody's possession. Music also needs to become more inclusive for the participant. For too long, we've had this horrible notion that we need to debunk, where you have the creative, the talented performer on one side of the room, and you have the detached listeners on the other side of the room. We need to bridge this gap. We need to make everyone realize the truth, that creativity is a process. It is not a gift. Humanity is by definition creative. We're born inquisitive, we're born determined. The benefits of music as an all-inclusive communal activity need to be realized and encouraged. Too often we hear things like this. Well, I can't sing like Pavarotti, so I'm not gonna bother with music. I can't play the guitar like Hendrix, so I'm putting that guitar down, I'm not bothering with music. That's basically like saying, I can't cook like Jamie Oliver, so I'm not gonna eat. <laughs> You're starving yourself of music's benefits. Any gorgeous? <laughs> <laughs> so as we're beginning to see elsewhere, with open source technology, freedom of information, convergence and collaboration always gives a richer outcome. So in a world, hold on, I'll just, you're going to be distracted if I leave his face up there. <laughs> in a world where one in eight go undernourished, one in eight, it is clear our system does not promote equality. Now as music is this innately unifying, as I've talked about, free and honest thing, it's clear that in a broken society, music's duty is to help communicate these problems, to help broadcast the possibilities, and at the very least to remind us all of our shared fate, to remind us that we're one human family on one planet, to bring us together. Now, to be an egotistical twat, I'm gonna finish on a quote by myself. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Countries are just lines drawn in the sand. This is no more apparent, no more evident than with music. Music knows no boundaries, it ignores borders, it knows no class, no race, no creed. When we listen to music, we're vulnerable. We're vulnerable to its emotive power. We're vulnerable to the point of almost subservience. 
And that encourages empathy, that encourages unity, because we know others are gonna be affected by music's power in just the same way. That creates an intimacy. The German composer, Robert Schumann, once said to send light into the darkness of men's hearts, such is the duty of the artist. This is something that obviously, not just musicians, composers, artists want to do. This is something that every healthy-minded human being wants to do, to shine light into other people's lives. It's a simple and elegant meaning of life. We're here together, we can help each other, we can progress as a species together. So let us not dwell or sit quietly in an economic system that discourages that simple desire. Thank you.